All right, guys, this, uh, this thing that I like to read, and I like to do it right after we do these drills, is about a Medal of Honor recipient, Master Sergeant Roy Benavidez. Yeah. And I'm going to take, uh, take a few minutes and, and read through it here. It's, it's a little lengthy, but I feel like it has value added, especially after what we just got done doing and with some of the uh, operational guys that we have here as well. And whether you're operational or not, it's, it's always, like Travis said earlier, excel into that next point. You will not be defeated. It's that mindset. As the medevac chopper landed, the wounded were examined one by one. Staff Sergeant Benavidez could only hear what was going on around him. He had over 37 puncture wounds. His intestines were exposed. He could not see. His eyes were caked in blood and unable to open. Neither could he speak, his jaw broken clubbed by a North Vietnamese rifle. But he knew what was happening, and it was the scariest moment of his life, even more so than the earlier events of the day. He lay in a body bag, bathed in his own blood. Jerry Cottenham, a friend, screamed, that's Benavidez, get a doc. The doc arrived and placed his hand on Roy's chest to feel a heartbeat. He pronounced him dead. The physician shook his head, there's nothing I can do for him. As the doctor bent over to zip up the body bag, uh, Benavidez did the only thing he could think of to let the doctor know he was alive. He spit in the doctor's face. The surprised doctor reversed Roy's condition from dead to, he won't make it, but we'll try. So again, what sucks now is I've got a guy working on me who doesn't really believe that he can fix me. So again, as medics out on a battlefield, we've got to work it as hard as we can, and I know some of you guys already do that. A 32-year-old Texas sharecropper had just performed for six hours one of the most remarkable feats in the Vietnam War. Benavidez, part of a, uh, and I'll probably mispronounce this, Yaqui Indian and a part of Mexican, was seventh, uh, a seventh-grade dropout and an orphan who grew up taunted by the term dumb Mexican. But as Ronald Reagan noted, if the story of what he accomplished was made into a movie, nobody would believe it if it really happened. Basically, uh, the ordeal began at Lok Nai, a Green Beret outpost near the Cambodian border. It was 1.30 p.m., May 2nd, 1968. The chaplain was holding a prayer service around a jeep for the sergeant and several other soldiers. Suddenly, shouts rang out from a nearby shortwave radio. Get us out of here, someone screamed, for God's sakes, get us out of here. The 12-man team consisted of Sergeant First Class Leroy Wright, Staff Sergeant Lloyd Frenchy Masusio, uh, Specialist 4 Brian O'Connor, and 9 Nung tribesmen monitoring enemy troop movements in the jungle had found itself surrounded by North Vietnamese Army Battalion. So that's a lot of guys. Without orders, Benavidez volunteered so quickly that he didn't even have time to bring an M16 when he dashed for the helicopter preparing for a rescue attempt. The sole weapon he carried was a Bowie knife on his belt. I'm coming with you, he told the three crew members. Airborne, they spotted soldiers in a tight circle. A few hundred enemy troops surrounded them in the jungle with some, within some uh, 25 yards off the Americans' positions. The chopper, dro chopper dropped in low, ran into wither and fire, quickly retreated, spotting a small clearing 75 yards away. Benavidez told the par uh, pilot, over there, over there. The helicopter reached the clearing and hovered 10 feet off the ground. Benavidez made a sign of the cross, jumped out carrying a medic bag, and began running 75 yards towards the trapped men. Almost immediately, he was hit by an AK-47 slug in his right leg. He stumbled and fell and got back up, convincing himself he had only snagged a thorn bush. Kept running to a brush pile where Wright's men lay. An exploding hand grenade knocked him down and ripped his face with shrapnel. <clears throat> Again, he got up, staggered to the men. Four of the soldiers were dead, the other eight wounded, pinned down into two groups. Benavidez bound their wounds, ejected morphine, and ignored NVA bullets and grenades passing out and around ammunition that he had taken from several other bodies and armed himself with an AK. Then he began directing airstrikes and called in for Huey helicopters to land near one of the groups to get him out. While calling in air support, he was shot again in the right thigh, his second gunshot wound. He dragged the dead and wounded aboard. So he's got two injuries to his legs and he's still dragging uh, wounded aboard. The chopper lifted a few feet off the ground and moved towards the second group. Benavidez running beneath it, firing his rifle he had picked up. Uh, he spotted the body of a team leader, Sergeant First Class Wright. Ordering the other soldiers to crawl towards the chopper, he retrieved the pouch dangling from the dead man's neck. In the pouch were classified papers with radio codes and call signs. As he shoved the papers into his shirt, a bullet struck his stomach, and a grenade shattered his back. The helicopter, barely off the ground, suddenly crashed. Pilot's dead. 
Coughing up blood, Benavidez made his way to the Huey, pulled out the wounded from the wreckage, forming a small perimeter. As he passed out ammunition taken from the dead, the air support he had called in earlier um, started arriving. Jets, <clears throat> jets and helicopter gunships draped threatened, uh, uh, threatening enemy uh, soldiers while Benavidez tended to the wounded. Are you hurt, Sarge? One, or, uh, one soldier asked. Hell no, said Benavidez, about the collapse from blood loss. I've been hit so many times, I don't care anymore. While mortar shells burst everywhere, Benavidez called in phantoms, danger close. Enemy fire raked the perimeter. Several other wounded were hit again, including Benavidez. By this time, he had blood streaming down his face, which was blinding him. Still calling in airstrikes, adjusting their targets by sound. Several times, pilots thought he was dead, but then his voice would come back on the radio calling for closer strikes. Throughout the fight, Benavidez um, basically made signs of the cross so many times his arms were getting uh, getting tired from doing because he was a devout Catholic. Finally, a helicopter landed. Uh, pray and move out, Benavidez told the men as he helped each one aboard. He carried a seriously wounded Frenchy Masuccio over his shoulder, um, but a fallen NVA soldier stood up, swung his rifle and clubbed Benavidez in the, in the head. Benavidez fell, rolled over, got up, just as a soldier lunged forward with his bayonet. Benavidez grabbed it, slashing his right hand. He pulled the attacker toward him. His left hand drew his uh, knife out and he stabbed the NVA, but not before the bayonet poked completely through his left forearm. Benavidez dragged Masuccio to the chopper. He saw two more NVA materialize out of the jungle. He snatched a fallen AK-47 rifle, shot both. Benavidez made one more trip into Claire and came back with a Vietnamese interpreter. Only then did the sergeant let one of the others pulled him aboard the helicopter. Blood dripped uh, from the door of the helicopter, lumbered into the air. Benavidez was holding his intestines with one hand. Bleeding almost into unconscious, Benavidez lay against the badly wasoon, uh, wounded Masuccio and held his hand. Just before he landed as a medevac, uh, at the medevac hospital, he felt his uh, fingers dig into the palm of my hand. Benavidez recalled his his arm twitched and jumped as if an electric current was pouring through his body into mine. Benavidez was so immobilized, they placed him with the dead. Even after he spit in the doctor's face, he was then taken from the body bag and was considered a goner. Benavidez spent almost a year in hospitals to recover from his injuries. He had several major gunshot wounds, 28 shrapnel holes, both arms had been slashed by bayonets. Uh, Benavidez had shrapnel in his head, scalp, shoulder, buttocks, feet, legs. His right lung was destroyed. He had injuries to his mouth and his back and his head from being clubbed with a rifle butt. One of the AK-47 bullets had entered his back, exiting just beneath his heart. He had won the battle and lived. Uh, when others were told about the battle was extremely awesome and extraordinary, he replied, that's just my duty. Basically what happened was he was, uh, because <clears throat> his... His commander didn't think he was going to live. They gave him the Navy Cross. It was like one of the fastest things to give somebody back then. They thought he died. When people realized he actually lived and, uh, and his commander realized that he lived, he was like, you're, you're telling me Roy's still alive? They basically had retyped it up and uh, President Reagan in 1988 gave him the Medal of Honor. The important thing of why we do what we do out here, why we spend, why Travis and I spend so much time doing shit that people normally don't like to do, getting into odd positions, moving the way we do, trying to stay dynamic, trying to drive those guns up as fast as we can, trying to keep things within reason. We sat out here and practiced a bunch of stuff that I guarantee most people don't practice. This class is not about doing what you like to do. On day one, we said it's about doing what you generally don't like to do what we're not good at. You never know what circumstance you're gonna find yourself in. Yes, some of you are military, so you can take this and you can decide how ironclad you wanna make yourself. Remember, you're not dead until somebody else above you turns out those lights. You keep fighting, you keep killing as many people as humanly possible. That's your drive, that's your goal. Because the life you may say Save might actually be mine out on the battlefield because you smoke checked a few more guys down range. Now, for those that are thinking, well, I'm, I'm not some Army Special Forces commando. It doesn't matter. The life you save may be your kids, it may be your wife, it may be your dad, your mom, it may be some innocent person in the mall 
when some scumbag comes in there and starts shooting a bunch of innocent people. It may be the few rounds out of your handgun that neutralizes that guy. You may get injured. You may get shot. It's business. Your goal is to neutralize those people. And that's what this stuff is about. That's why we're out here. That's why you guys are out here. That's why you guys are advanced shooters, because you're willing to come out here and push yourself harder. You're willing to push yourself to those failure points that we bring up. Most people don't want to push themselves to failure, because then we don't look good. But then you never get better. You know, they say that uh, amateurs train until they get it right. Professionals train until they get it wrong. And that's what we're doing. You guys are professionals. So I appreciate you guys doing some of those things that you may think don't apply to you because, well, if you're shot, you might not be able to manipulate your weapon systems too good. Just think about what I read right there and just remember, man, you're Superman. You're King Kong. Until the day you die. Until the day you die. Now, do you think Master Sergeant Roy Benavides ever thought he'd be in that type of situation? Hell no. But he was. And, uh, and it can happen to anybody here. So we prepare for the worst, and that's why shooting starts in the mind, because obviously that man was mentally prepared, no matter what. He fought through to the death, and he almost did. So um, that's why we take so much pride in what we do, and again, that's why we're all out here. So you're a special breed, you're a special personality to, to take these the advantage of this type of training and to be that personality. It's like uh, myself and Justin talked about last night. You know, you've got your guys that are hobbyists and adventurers. You got your guys that just have to do it as a job. You got your operator door kicker types, and then you've got that classification of person that is can be any one of those four, but they're hardcore, die-hard passionate about what we do because we understand the consequences, and uh, and that's what we want to be. Great job today. We're gonna uh, break, come back out. We still have more to do. A lot more to do. Thanks, guys.